Oh, I'll take word salad for 500, Alex. And the category is balancing your hormones. Yes, whenever someone gets on the internet, claims to have a supplement or some sort of headstand maneuver that's gonna balance your hormones, just scroll on past, walk away, because endocrinology, really, really complicated field, lots of different hormones, all right? It's not a checkbook, all right? It's not a budget. You're not adding numbers here and subtracting there. What hormone are you talking about? and what is actually going on. What is actually wrong with you? Well, I think a lot of us are aware of the fact that thyroid hormone is one of those that can get out of whack. Either it can be too high or too low. It's the Goldilocks effect. And thyroid hormone is super important for many different processes in your body, such as controlling metabolism and energy needs. And I've already got, okay, I've already got a video all about the skin signs of your thyroid being too low. Hypothyroidism is is a lot more common than hyperthyroidism. And the testament to that fact is just looking at the view count on my skin signs of hypothyroid video versus my skin signs of hyperthyroid, all right? They're out of whack. So that tells you everything you need to know. But while the endocrinologists do the hormone thing, dermatologists, we are doctors, not just of the skin, but the hair and the nails. And I've already got a video on how thyroid being out of whack impacts your nails. So you guessed it. Today we're talking about the hair. We're doing a deep dive on why your hair might be trying to tell you something about your old thyroid. So thyroid hormone is really instrumental in regulating hair follicle cell division and entry into the growing phase of the hair cycle. So much so that there are many obvious hair changes that occur in the setting of different thyroid disorders. Thyroid hormone is necessary for the hair follicle cells to divide. And I've said this before, but forming and making hair Hair is actually very energy demanding. It requires a lot of ATP, the cellular currency. It requires healthy blood flow to the follicle to bring in growth factors. So when you have hypothyroidism, that cellular division slows down and you have a decrease in the number of hairs that are actively in the growing stage of the hair cycle, antigen. The duration of antigen, the growing phase, is shorter when you have low thyroid hormone because you're not getting that good kick in the pan to divide your hair follicle cells. When I say it's the Goldilocks effect, however, if you have hyperthyroidism, meaning too much thyroid hormone, it's not good for your hair either. Why? Well, it creates a lot of oxidative damage, reactive oxygen species, and cellular death. So it too is bad for your hair follicle. Everything's about, well, as the grifters say, being in balance, in alignment, as they like to say. Who knows what they're talking about? But yeah, thyroid hormone, you wanna have just right. Even mild little tweaks in your thyroid hormone levels in your blood can directly impact the hair follicle and the hair cycle. So when you have low thyroid, not only will you experience hair loss, but it's pretty stressful on your body and it's not getting the proper signals necessary for the hair to go into the growing phase. Instead, the hair shifts around in your head like, okay, we're not, we're not getting told to do what we need to do, so we're confused. So things shift around, you get more hairs that end up in the resting phase, the shedding phase, and about three months after, after, it takes about three months, three months after the thyroid hormone becomes too low, well, you'll experience massive hair shedding, meaning hair just coming out. This is not permanent hair loss, all right? It's just hair that's coming out, and the goal is to eventually have a new healthy hair come in. But with the loss of that proper thyroid signal, you don't necessarily get that reintroduction into the growing phase which is called antigen. So you get this massive shedding. Like it's normal to shed about 100 hairs a day, but if you've got hypothyroidism, you're gonna be shedding a ton. You're in the shower, it's coming out in the little drain thing, which ugh, ugh. It makes me reflexively gag to pull hair out of a drain. Oh, 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 nasty, nasty, nasty. Don't know what it is about wet hair out of a drain. Um, so you'll deal with a lot of that. And we've talked about this phenomenon in other hair videos before. It's known as helogen effluvium, and it can happen um, um, after any sort
sort of stressful event, whether it be you got in a car accident, you had a major surgery, you had a viral illness, you lost a ton of weight relatively quickly, you went on a crash diet, um, maybe you ran a marathon, or maybe you had a baby, okay? Because that shifts all the hormones around and everything gets kind of out of whack and it's pretty stressful to birth a human. And lo and behold, your hair is like, ooh, let's rearrange. And you experience that massive shedding. This is you know, sort of another example of that, but rather than the fact that it's stressful, which is a part of it, the other key fact as to why this happens with low thyroid is that thyroid hormone is really what is getting the hair follicles to be in the growing stage. I mean, it's, it's right there and it's directly coaching, if you will, the hair follicle. So that's something you can experience. But furthermore, when you have low thyroid, um, you'll recall from my video on signs of hypothyroidism, you kind of have dry skin. Hypothyroidism also leads to dry, brittle hair that's going to be a lot more vulnerable to breakage. So hair can become brittle and prone to breakage as part of the natural aging process, also can become brittle and prone to breakage with a lot of heat styling, different chemical processing. If you use that flat iron a lot, maybe you don't use a heat protectant. It definitely can become more vulnerable to, to breakage and certain hair textures are gonna be even more at baseline vulnerable to breakage because of the way they're shaped, okay? They have a curvature to them and therefore they're just a lot more prone to breakage at certain turns of the hair as opposed to straighter hair type. If you add hypothyroidism onto that, not only are you getting a lot of shedding, not only are you getting a reduction in hairs actively in the growing stage, but now you're getting a lot of breakage. And breakage plus shedding together, you get all of this in your hands. Oh my gosh, it's psychologically distressing to say the least. What about hyperthyroidism though? Okay, surely, like I said, you know, don't don't assume that if too low is bad, then, then more must be better. Uh -uh. Too much, like I said, harmful to the cells, creates too much oxidative stress, and you can get diffuse hair loss with hyperthyroidism. Plus, it affects the hair shaft integrity. You have a hair shaft that is not as strong. The tensile strength, meaning if you took the hair and you pulled it like this, it'd be a lot more prone to snapping. So you get um, brittleness in a sense. So hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, you know, while hyper is not as common as hypo, they both can happen and they both obviously have pretty direct impacts on your scalp hair. Not to mention hair on the rest of your body, especially with hypothyroidism, you might experience a loss of your eyebrow hair, the lateral aspect of your brow may begin to thin. That's known as Queen Anne sign. Check out my video all about uh, brow growth serums. I compare minoxidil to uh, Latisse, Rogaine to Latisse for brows. Definitely check that out. But you know, it's always important to first and foremost know why you have a given problem. And in this case, if it's underlying thyroid abnormality causing lateral brow thinning, you need to address your thyroid, okay? All the Latisse, all the Rogaine up there, you know, that's, that's, a secondhand uh, thing. You need to, to address the thyroid because thyroid hormone is so important for the rest of your body that you can thank your hair for falling out and freaking you out and cluing you into the fact that you need, need thyroid hormone. One of the most common reasons to have low thyroid hormone is an autoimmune condition known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, much more common in women. And one of the things with regards to hair is not only will you experience a lot of the things that we have talked about here with regards to excessive shedding um, fewer hairs in the growing stage, brittleness, dryness, dull hair. But with autoimmune hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, you are at an increased likelihood of developing another type of hair loss, autoimmune hair loss, because Hashimoto's is an autoimmune thyroid disease. What autoimmune hair loss are you most likely to get? It's called alopecia areata. And I have a whole video talking about alopecia areata. As a matter of fact, about 5% of patients who have alopecia alopecia areata, autoimmune hair loss, also have subclinical hypothyroidism, meaning they're not quite developing signs and symptoms of low thyroid yet. But the fact that they have alopecia areata should be kind of a warning sign to at least entertain the idea that the person might have um, autoimmune thyroid disease, especially women. This is a lot more common in women, likely related to genetics. Now, alopecia areata looks a lot different than excessive hair shedding brittle hair or diffuse hair loss. With alopecia areata, it's quite alarming to experience in that all of a sudden, because of the nature of the way the immune system sort of attacks the follicle, 
you get this sudden clump of hair that falls out and you have a smooth patch of bald. This too can impact your eyebrows or other body sites, not just the scalp. Oftentimes it will resolve. You may get other patches of involved hair loss in the future. There's no cure for it. Sometimes people develop it and it goes away and doesn't come back. But other times it becomes this chronic on and off thing that you have to deal with. There are medications that address the alopecia areata, which I discuss in my video all about it. Now, in contrast to just hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, with alopecia areata, the extent of alopecia areata isn't necessarily correlated with the severity of the thyroid disease. I Meaning you could have profoundly, profoundly low thyroid hormone, like, and just very mild case of alopecia areata. But they are associated, especially in women. There's also an association not related to this video per se, but there's also an association with autoimmune thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, and vitiligo, another autoimmune condition, this time skin and sometimes hair as well, where the immune system attacks the pigment producing cells. So you get loss of pigment um, leading to patches of bone white skin, but it can impact the hair follicle cells and you get loss of hair color. All right, let's talk about another type of hair loss related to your thyroid, and that is actually the most common type of hair loss to affect both men and women, it's called androgenetic alopecia. And androgenetic alopecia involves a shrinking of the hair follicle. And a lot of this is related to, again, your genetics, as well as another hormone, dihydrotestosterone, otherwise known as DHT. It's a very potent testosterone that signals to the hair follicle to shrink. And in women, this can result in a widening of the central part and um, the frontal hairline, some hair loss, as well as loss of hair in the sides of the scalp. And a lot of it, you know, is genetic, but if you have a thyroid disease, there is a greater likelihood that you have also concomitant androgenetic alopecia or female pattern hair loss. As a matter of fact, an estimated 52.2% prevalence of androgenetic alopecia in postmenopausal women. There's a 31.5% prevalence of low thyroid. Low thyroid is pretty common, especially in postmenopausal women who have female pattern hair loss. Like alopecia areata, there's no correlation between the overall severity of the hypothyroidism and the extent of the female pattern hair loss. With age and especially with menopause and the decline in estrogen, our hair changes a lot. It changes in texture, it changes in thickness, the growth rate slows down, and the hair shafts get thinner. And of course, if you have a tendency towards androgenetic alopecia, that will become more obvious. And if you've got hypothyroid on top of that, there can often be an association, plus you're losing some of the fuel of the thyroid hormone at the level of the follicle. So it can make pattern hair loss much more uh, involved, much more significant to have all of these multiple factors on, on top of one another. All right, and then last but not least, a, another type of hair loss that is more common in uh, menopausal women and can be mistaken uh, if not appropriately evaluated for other types of hair loss, it's called frontal fibrosis fibrosing alopecia. Frontal fibrosing alopecia is a variant of lichen planus, an inflammatory skin condition that affects the hair follicle. You get inflammation that comes in around the follicle and creates these rough bumps with the surrounding bit of redness that involves the frontal scalp. And it's really important that this be identified and diagnosed early because if it goes untreated, what happens is that inflammation that comes around the follicle, it wipes the follicle out and a scar forms. Once a scar forms, the hair will not grow back. There is an association, a pretty good association, um, with hypothyroidism, low thyroid, and frontal fibrosing alopecia. About 22.9% of patients who have frontal fibrosing alopecia also have low thyroid. So with frontal fibrosing alopecia, not only do you get those little bumps around the hair follicle, and then eventually you get hair loss and scarring of the follicle. Over time, what happens is the process just moves its way back, and you really, really, really start to get receding of the frontal hairline um, all the way back. And it, it's quite, it's quite dra it can be quite drastic. Not to mention most cases will have some degree of eyebrow involvement as well with loss of the brows. So now you've got a couple of hits to your eyebrows as well. You might have frontal fibrosing alopecia coupled with low thyroid and just overall loss of, of the lateral aspect of the eyebrows. You can start to see how not only is it hair loss, but it, now it becomes a question of the brows as well, which you know, that is hair, but usually 
probably worth thinking about here on, a, on our scalp. Funny enough, aside from alopecia areata, frontal fibrosing alopecia also can affect body hair, like underarm hair, uh, pubic hair, hair on your legs. But that's one where diagnosis is key. So clearly you can see, oh, I made a rhyme. There I go again, I'm a poet and I don't know it. You can see that thyroid hormone, it's really important directly for healthy hair growth. And that when our thyroid is not operating properly, we're not having good appropriate levels of thyroid hormone, or either we have too much or we have too little, it has a huge impact on our hair. Also, having these disorders of the thyroid, namely hypothyroidism, puts us at greater risk for other hair loss disorders like alopecia areata and female pattern hair loss, otherwise known as androgenetic alopecia, as well as frontal fibrosing alopecia. Speaking of which, speaking of which, check out my video all about frontal fibrosing alopecia. It's gonna open your eyes. It's gonna open your eyes, especially if you're one of those menopause age, perimenopause, whose hair has been thinning, you've been losing hair, and you're just going, oh, this is what I have to deal with now that I'm in this age group, da 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 There's nothing they're gonna be able to do for me. Wrong. Watch that video. Your eyes will be opened wide. All right, y'all. I hope you enjoyed this one. If so, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.